to see it. Is this going to be an internal wing 101? Actually, it's going to be a tied 101. Oh, false advertisement. Yes. <laughs> well, we'll get to the internal waves. That's, that's, that's where we're heading towards. <laughs> I believe they would have an interest in internal waves. In fact, they have a chair at about 50, 30 to 150 meters. And we know that they do have impacts. Wow. Yeah. That, that, that was the migration gap? And, all, and also, you know, because in some cases they may get this close to polar water. Okay. You know, that's the way. Right. Thank you for attending, and it's my great pleasure to welcome and introduce Dr. James Richmond. Uh, Jim is a really interesting person. He got his undergraduate degree in physics from Harvey Mudd College in California, and then got his PhD in physical oceanography from MIT Woods Hole Oceanographic uh, Institution. After that, he spent the next 30 years being a professor in physical oceanography at Oregon State University in Corvallis. And after that, he announced his first official retirement. For the next eight years, he worked as a senior scientist and oceanographer 
at Stennis Space Center Naval Research Lab, where I had a great pleasure to work with him on many interesting projects for about eight years. So last year, he announced his official second retirement uh, from the Naval Research Lab, U.S. Navy. Right now, he's a part-time senior scientist at Florida State University, working on global tight high-resolution modeling. And his real full-time job is raising 38 sheep, goats, and lambs in his Oregon farm uh, in Corvallis, Oregon. So uh, he's going to talk about the internal tide and internal waves for the global ocean models. Uh, I know we have many participants uh, dialing in remotely, so we appreciate you attending this webinar. If you have any questions, please type in, and uh, Nicole here will be uh, relay your questions, and Jim will answer uh, after his uh, talk. All right, well, thank you very much, and let's welcome Dr. Jim Richmond. So in the, in the vein of uh, truth and advertising, I will eventually get around to internal tides and, and waves, but you're going to have to bear with uh, me on, uh, on tides for a, a while rather than internal tides. Um, what I'd like to talk about today is work that's being done um, at the Naval Research Laboratory in the Oceanography Division down in uh, southern Mississippi. And uh, this work's being done in collaboration with actually a bunch of people here, so Brian Arbic uh, at the University of Michigan, Martin Buzman, who's at the University of Southern Michigan, and Jay Shriver, who's uh, at NRL Stennis. We're all here for a, a project meeting uh, with Brian. And uh, so I've been involved in a lot of this, um, but in fact, most of the publications that I will pull pictures from and stuff like that are actually from the, the group in the back of the room. And uh, so if you really want to ask questions, you can go corner them. Um, but there's a number of, quite a number of people involved in getting this going. Um, sorry. Okay. So one of the major activities that's, that's done in the Oceanography Division is developing a global ocean forecast system. So it's effectively a weather model, but for the ocean. Um, and in this forecast system, there's two major parts. There actually is the dynamical model that makes the forecast, and then the data assimilation system, which is used to take observations, blend them with the model to give you an initial condition to run your forecast forward. And so right now, this is being done routinely uh, by the operational Navy, and you can actually look at those routine things, uh, products, either on the NRL website or you can get the, the data itself from uh, Florida State um, on their server for uh, HICOM. But every day, you run forecast out for seven days. Um, and the current system is based upon uh, 112 degree. That's about eight kilometer resolution globally. That's what's considered an eddy or weather resolving model inside the ocean. And the plan is to transition this in a couple of years to a four kilometer resolution model. Um, just to give you a sense, uh, four kilometers is basically about 10,000 points by 10,000 points in the horizontal. Um, and then there's 41 layers in the vertical. And we uh, generate um, about, um, bear with me, Jay, it's about, about 10 gigabytes of data for every snapshot that you, uh, you create on this. So it generates a lot of data very quickly um, to look at what's going on. And in this model, the, one of the biggest things we'll do is also add uh, tides. And uh, just to, up here on the screen, you'll see an animation, which is uh, I grabbed uh, a year, a while ago. Um, and this is the sea surface height, the predictions from the model, and as I said, um, Every day you do an analysis and you run a forecast, and what you're looking at right now actually are, this, are the analyses. That is a snapshot of the model once a day, and uh, this is done for, for a year. Um, and these forecasts are then used by the Navy um, for decision aids. So 
things that we don't normally think about, you know, when they want to go launch an exercise or whatever. Um, they're used to predict the acoustic properties in the ocean for finding submarines and uh, things like that. And they're also used as bo provide boundary conditions for regional models. And in those regional models, traditionally what you do is you take the large scale model, ocean models, boundary conditions, and you add to it a barotropic tide. And then you have the tides in near the coast where you want, and you, you then have a new set of decision tools that, and forecasts that you can make. Um, but there's been a, uh, recently a fair amount of information that's come forward that says that indeed tidal information propagating from far away into the regions may actually affect the regional solutions. Um, and so the decision was made to sort of say could we in fact put um, tides directly into the global model and make a forecast of the tides as well as the ocean circulation. And Brian did that um, in this, this model. Um, and so now we actually have, in principle, a model where eventually we will be able to predict not only the ocean circulation, but the tides. And it turns out that when we put the uh, surface tides in, for instance, one you see that makes everything but lakes go up and down, um, when you put that into the ocean, as those tides move over bathymetry in a stratified ocean, they generate internal waves and give the punch line away a little bit. That in turn actually is generating a very robust um, in internal gravity wave field, uh, not just at tidal frequencies, but across the entire range of internal wave frequencies in this model. So it's been a very exciting uh, evolution that we've had over the past few years. Um, so. Um, well, I thought I had the things. So on the, on the uh, screen, there should have been little boxes about the things that were added to make you go from a standard sort of shallow water model to a tide model. <clears throat> so um, if you look up there, you'll see that traditionally there's the normal equation motions. You have the pressure forcing, and you add two new terms. One is the gravitational um, equilibrium pressure forcing, if you want, from the attraction of the sun and the moon, which is called A to equilibrium. And then you actually have to provide a correction, which is called the self-attraction and loading, which is, in fact, the Earth itself deforms. You have solid Earth tides. And the water, as you move it around, you're moving around a fair amount of mass, and that mass actually attracts itself, so it has a self-attraction. Um, and then you have bottom friction. Um, as a quadratic drag, it's um, the next term over, and a new term which is in the barotropic tide model represents the generation, the conversion of the tidal motion itself into internal mo uh, motion. So it represents now a loss of energy, an internal wave drag, and, and then finally you have the other forcings you have, um, internal friction, um, wind forcing, which uh, like that. So NRL uses a, what's called a tripole grid. It just happens to be the way. And we've added the attraction, the equilibrium tide, that is to say the, the gravitational attraction of the sun and the moon. And we've added then a, um, a self-attraction and loading, the correction for the uh, actual movement. And um, initially, this was done in a very simple way, just making a um, it's called a scalar approximation, a very crude way of looking at it. And you, you solve this solution, and then you get a better solution by then um, either tuning it, varying the wave drag or bottom drag coefficients, um, and then you also can go back and iterate, as it's called, or you can say, well, this scalar approximation isn't very, really a very good approximation, but I have to know what the height field looks like to actually figure out what the self-attraction and loading is. So I solve it, I take this field, I get a guess for what that is, I put that back in and solve it again. Um, and there are two parameters that you can tune in this um, model if you want, one of which is the bottom drag, the quadratic bottom drag, the CD, and the other is this linear uh, internal wave drag, uh, which is called C. When I started out as a graduate student, in the dark ages, um, nobody actually 
thought about the internal wave drag, it was all the sh drag in the shallow water. That's where the quadratic drag applies because that's where the velocities are much stronger. Um, and so, you know, people were trying to tune the drag coefficients on the Patagonian shelf and, and other places. It wasn't really until the advent of satellite altimetry. Do everybody here know how a satellite altimeter works in, in principle? Um, so you've got a radar up in space, and the typical ones we have, they're a thousand kilometers up in space. They send a pulse of, of microwave energy down uh, to the sea surface, it reflects off the sea surface, and you measure the travel time between the satellite um, and the, the ground below it, in the ocean in this case. And then you actually spend a lot of effort to track out and find out where that satellite is relative to the surface of the Earth, and you have to make corrections for the fact that um, microwaves, actually the speed of uh, light changes as you go through the, the medium, so there's actually a change in the travel t uh, speed. You go through all this and you can actually make this measurement of height of the ocean. Um, now that comes back rather infrequently every 10 days or thereabout, but because the tides have a well-known um, period, I can actually recover the tidal uh, amplitudes out of this signal. So suddenly, I had the ability to look at the tidal amplitudes over the entire globe, instead of just at isolated points along the, um, the coastlines or islands. And then when that information was sort of blended back with that sort of simple dynamical model, realized that in fact, something like 40% of the energy in the in the tide is actually dissipated in the open ocean, and so it led to this uh, including of internal wave drag into the uh, um, into the models. Um, but we can vary these things to try to improve the accuracy of, of the tide, and that's where my boxes went. Sorry. Um, okay, so just as a thing, so I can I can tune these things, and then I look at the the difference between some truth. Um, and that could be tide gauges, it could be uh, bottom pressure gauges, which are deep water tide gauges, or it could in fact be one of these altimetric uh, representations of the tides. And then I'm going to adjust my parameters and fiddle with my model a little bit to try to minimize the uh, uh, RMS difference between what I think the real tide is and what my tide forecast um, is. And uh, Something that, that Martin did very nicely is show that if you look at where you actually have the minimum RMS, the smallest difference, that would be the best comparison of your height signal to the other signal, isn't necessarily at the, at the point that might have the dissipation that I need uh, to balance out. One of the things I really know about the global system is the sun and the, um, the moon and the earth system dissipates energy. That's, that's known very well. And so astronomically, that's a constraint on the, on the system. Um, and <clears throat> so I need to have that much dissipation in my, in my model. Um, and so there's some additional physical understanding that's needed to kind of get a, a really good description of the entire um, internal and external tidal systems. Um, so one question is, how well do I actually know, um, know the tides? So this is a very busy slide, but just bear with me. There's a recent paper uh, um, with a lot of people trying to compare the best tide models with 151 deep water gauges and then a whole series of continental shelf and coastal tide gauges. Actually, they did look in the Arctic and the Antarctic as well. And so there are seven models that were sort of in this competition. The seven models actually agreed pretty well in general. Um, and when you compare them to our these deep water tide gauges, which were not used by any of the models to actually create their solution, then it turns out the RMS error globally in this main semidurnal tide is half a centimeter. Okay, so it's it's pretty small. Um, so that's the target that we would uh, eventually love to be forecasting. When we started all this stuff, the, the target was about two centimeters. So the, the uh, tide modelers are getting better um, with time. 
but <clears throat> so so this is this is you know how well we actually think we know what's going on um, but there's differences between those models and how they they work um, and we need to figure out the uh, sort of solution we have. so that given then we we took that additional forcing and we put it in the three-dimensional model and then we came back and we can look at the tidal solution. So with all those simplifications that I talked about initially, um, we created a, a tidal simulation and the RMS error that we had in this first look was seven centimeters. It was quite a bit bigger, but it's still not, uh, not too bad. And if you look by eye, the sort of best barotropic tide model, this is uh, from the TPXO, Egbert et al., um, and our tidal solution, quali you know, qualitatively um, and quantitatively, look quite close. It's just there are uh, much more, much larger differences in these models than um, when you actually look carefully relative to the things. And if you actually look at the air, so this is now the difference, the RMS differences between those two pictures that I had. You can see that in this first solution, we have very large errors all around Antarctica very large errors in the Atlantic, um, and we have some significant errors in the Pacific and Indian Ocean. And you can think about characterizing these errors. Are they errors in the absolute height, or are they errors in the timing, the arrival of the, uh, um, the, the tide itself? And um, so particularly in the Pacific, um, come back to those big blobs in the Pacific tend to be more errors in the timing of the tide rather than errors in the height of the tide. But overall, it's about evenly split. So my error budget says um, about half that error is associated with having an incorrect amplitude, and about half that error is sort of associated with an amplitude-weighted uh, phase uh, difference. Um, so um, it turns out that in the course of doing this, um, we also noticed that the tide modelers themselves did some things to extend the ocean underneath the ice shelves, uh, which we hadn't done in the global circulation model. Um, and this model had a scalar um, SAL. Sorry. So um, we, we came back and thought about what things we could do to it. But the other thing to bear in mind is, that as we begin to really evaluate this, is that we do know something about how much energy is dissipated astronomically. It's about 3.7 terawatts. Um, and the principal semi-journal tide um, dissipates about 2.5 uh, terawatts. And most of that is in the ocean tide. And then there's this range of uncertainty that, that comes about, which is how much of that is in the shallow seas and how much of that is in the uh, deep ocean. Um, because shallow seas, I might be able to change that by changing the quadratic drag coefficient. Deep water is going to be changed by changing the amount that's converted into internal gravity waves, uh, internal tides. Um, and as you can see, approximately um, sort of on the order of about 40% of the energy is being dissipated in deep water. So that's kind of a target that we uh, need to have as a sanity check for any model that we are uh, producing. Um, and Martin actually, uh, in a paper, looked at the tidal dissipation that comes out of um, one of these barotropic tide models and the corresponding tidal dissipation that comes out of our model. And I think you can see that qualitatively they're, they're very similar. Um, there are differences in the, in the, somewhat in the magnitude, in the, and we tend to have very much more narrowly focused regions of higher dissipation compared to the uh, um, barotropic models. But uh, again, it's it, it, we're passing the sanity check if you want, um, and uh, we're in the right quantitative ballpark for the solutions that we're getting. Okay, so so the answer is that. We, we created this solution. It's pretty good. Um, if I take my glasses off, and I'm very um, far-sighted, so you know, things look nice and blurry. 
they they look very very similar, you know. But I put my glasses on, and they don't they don't really work as as well as you might like. So what are the things that that we can do to improve the model to try to um, uh, get a better tie? So one of them was the self attraction and loading. Um, the problem is that the way that the self attraction and loading is traditionally done, this iteration, it it works very well in these barotropic tide models, which can be linearized and done in a frequency domain, so you only have to do this iteration every so often. But I'm doing this model is, is a global forecast model, and so I have to run it for a long time to try to extract the tide to try to, to do the correction, and much of the elevation variations, the mass changes I might have, are not in fact associated with the tide, but associated with the wind-driven and ocean circulation. So. It, the iteration, it's, it's possible to do, but it's not something that we'd want to do routinely. But when you're trying to see how, what it takes to get something right, you can afford to do these sorts of things um, on a limited base. So, so we know that we can improve things by uh, improving the representation of the self-attraction and loading. Um, we um, also basically changed out the, the form of the wave drag just makes it a little bit easier for us to do some tuning experiments. Um, and we extended the domain of the model to include the ocean underneath the floating ice shelves. Um, and so we then created, generated a new solution. And this new tidal solution went from 7 centimeters to about 4.4 uh, 4 centimeters. So it's a significant improvement. It's still a ways away from where we'd like to be um, in that. So, um, so the best barotropic tidal models do data simulation, but the technique that they use for data simulation is not possible to be used directly in the forecast model that we have. So uh, we borrowed an approach from data simulation to try to come up with a way to get a better force, tidal forcing for our uh, model. Um, and this is actually it was a pretty innovative uh, piece of work which just recently published on a paper by Hans Nygodak and, and all of us. Um, and so the technique that we're going to use is formally called an augmented state ensemble common filter. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll go through a little bit of mathematics, but just listen to the words and don't worry so much about the, about the equations. So what I have is that over time, the sea, sea surface height and the velocities are going to change associated with the forcings that are applied to them, so this gravitational attraction, what have you. And in a perfect model, that would just be this sort of dxtt, the change in height and velocity is equal to all the forcings applied so, that, so it's just F equals MA if you're in physics. And then, then, but I do this as a numerical implementation. I don't know everything perfectly. So I have some error in my forcing, okay? Some error in the, in the force being applied. That's this little F, okay? And then I have some observations. I'm gonna call those capital um, Y. And those observations are relatable back to the um, things that I, actually try to predict. So sometimes you might not have uh, an observation which is actually something you formally predict. So for example, the biologists here use ocean color, right? Um, and you, so you, the observation is ocean color, but you may predict chlorophyll, okay? So you have to have some, you know, some way of changing the color to chlorophyll, okay? So this fancy little H is nothing more than a matrix which takes that. Now, I'm only going to look at sea surface height, so actually my H is 1, so it's pretty easy, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that. And then there's some error. That is to say, the observations themselves are not perfect. Okay? So, um, and I'm going to then blend those two. It's in the parlance of, of data simulation, I'm going to create an analysis. The blend of the model and the observations, and I'm going to do that um, by having some statistical description between how the observations are related across themselves. Um, and I'm probably butchering this for the real data simulators, but it's, it's, it'll work for the moment. 
And in this particular case, I'm going to generate this statistical correlation by creating a whole bunch of different representations. That is to say, I'm going to take the model, I'm going to kick it away from reality a little bit, and I'm going to run the model. It's a nonlinear model, and it's going to generate me a slightly different solution. And I'm going to take all those kicked estimates, blend them together to build sort of a statistical relationship. So that's my ensemble. Uh, it's going. Hmm? The little f, the little, the, the big f, that's all the forces. So that's, the, the, the small f is the air in the forces. It's the things I don't know about that. So it could be, for example, I get winds from someplace, but they could be wrong. Um, I have a numerical implementation. So, for example, in the tides, I don't necessarily represent the bathymetry of the coastlines accurately. I have numerical error that comes in. So it's all the things that cause me to have an error in actually predicting the evolution given the, the forcing that I have. So if you want to think about it, just like the um, observations have error, the, the, the model itself has error. So I'm just going to represent that by some uh, some, some forcing term. And this one gets a little bit small, but effectively I'm going to augment the state um, vector in this case. So I have the, the height and the velocities that I estimate. And now I'm going to say, well, I also can make a prediction of that air, that little f that I have. So I'm going to add a stochastic equation for that little f. And now I'm going to make a a prediction using my machinery of data simulation of not just the actual state of the of the tides, but the best forcing that I would apply to the tide model to give me back that best state. Okay. Um, so, so this is the the augmentation, and um, and remember I told you that I'm going to take the uh, the model and I'm going to perturb it in some way. So we had that. Pressure forcing term, you know, which is G grad eta plus eta equilibrium plus eta SAL. And I'm going to put an additional eta perturbation into that. And this is kind of one of the perturbations that I have. So um, it's a little bit blurry for the room, but the darkest colors are 8 centimeters. Um, the average height of the M2 tide over the ocean is about 30 centimeters over, over deep water. So I'm putting on a perturbation just roughly on the order of about a third of the amplitude tide. And we generated this randomly. And the scales of this kind of looked like what, a, what that self-attraction and loading field looked like, just, just how we did it. So we created 100 of these perturbations. We ran the, the full 3D model with this extra term 100 times for a month um, to, uh, to get this new set of uh, ensemble members. Um, and then I actually can't run the, un the ensemble common filter on the full 3D model because um, you didn't see it in there, but I have to invert a matrix. And so if I did it on the full 3D model, that would be 41 by 1,000 by 1,000 by 5 uh, inversion. So that requires calculations which are that big raised to the third power. Um, so um, I can't do that. So we made an, an, an assumption, which is to say that we think that the tide solution, in some sense, isn't strong in modifying the global ocean circulation uh, in a fundamental way. So I can analyze the tidal solution from the, each one of those 100 uh, ensemble members. And instead of doing the estimation of the full um, ocean state, I'll just do it for the tidal height, um, um, which is all that I actually have data. So I come up with a new um, sort of state estimation, which is just really the estimation of the, of the sea surface height, um, the tidal estimates of the sea surface height. And I'm going to come up with a new forcing function, which is just that piece that I would add to force one. And I'll do that for each of the tidal constituents that I have in, in my model. Uh, in this particular case, we had five of them. Um, so, so then you can run this machinery and you come back with this is that little f, that forcing correction. So this is the height forcing that I would apply to the, to the model. 
to give me the best um, title solution that I could have. And you can see that it's very, very large in the Atlantic Ocean, but there are patches around the globe to, to fix the solution. Um, sorry, I'm not sure why I keep bumping it the wrong way. Okay, so we, we did a number of different experiments looking at that, and primarily we varied how tightly we wanted to believe the observations. Um, and so you remember we started out with a global RMS of seven, and we actually also looked at it, which is to say that there's a distribution to the size of the errors. We said we can, we can look at the average over the whole globe. We can also find where, what's the middle value. So half the errors are larger than that, half the errors are smaller than that. That's the median. And we can look at it in terms of the Atlantic um, and the rest of the globe, excluding the Atlantic. And we'll, I'll come back to that because the Atlantic is our biggest problem. And so I started at seven, then we did the one where we changed the geometry, we changed the drag and tuned the drag up a little bit, and we extended the domain to include the energy. So we got to four, and then you can see a whole series of solutions where we're down at between two and a half and three, three centimeters. Um, there's, there's one in here that technically is very interesting, um, which is we made a slight mistake. We said, believe the observations that they just actually have to be really, really right. So we said the OBS error is only half a millimeter. Okay? Um, and you can see that solution is not significantly different than, than the rest of the solutions. So this was one of the questions we had to, to address. Um, but um, this is the corresponding map of amplitude and phase um, for the this extended Coleman filter that we had, and that's, the, that's actually the data set that we were simulating. That's the TPXO data set. And so, again, by eye, you know, um, they look very, very close. And so the RMS error for those two is, is uh, um, only two and a half centimeters. Okay. And if I go and look at those differences, so this is the difference point by point of how big is the... Uh, best barotropic model from the, um, the observed, from the solution we have. And of course, so this solid line is the median solution, uh, median error. Um, and you can see as I go from the initial solution to my sort of best um, iterated solution to two of the, the solutions that I, I looked at from this augmented some common filter that um, Globally, you can see that I basically am I'm collapsing the air. I'm moving it, it farther and farther to the, um, to the left. Um, and, but you can still see that I have some tails out there that are really, really large. Um, but if you look at the Atlantic, you can see that actually the Atlantic is kind of behaving a, a, not nearly as well on this case. And um, so that's where the errors in this particular model are really dominating. Um, okay, and if I just come back and, and sort of show you a picture, this is a picture on the same color bar of the air between, the RMS air between the best high, tile, barotropic tidal model assimilating data and our solutions. Um, and so that's our initial solution up on the, the top left. The, the solution that we sort of did when we changed the geometry in the SAL. And these are a couple of the solutions from this augmented state uh, Coleman filter. And so I've got the air down to this sort of 2.6 centimeters, which, which is good. We'd like to do better. And we particularly would like to do better in the, um, in the Atlantic. Um, and then the other thing is I told you that what we did was we also predicted that correction. So, um, so I can come back and say, now I can rerun the, the three-dimensional model with that new forcing correction. And of course, the background ocean underneath it won't be exactly the same. And the, the tidal solution isn't going to be exactly the same. So the differences between these two are the differences between the prediction of the Kalman filter and the prediction of the, um, of the model. And again, you can see that um, the way it's set up, if you see a, a blue color, that's actually where the, uh, 
um, the, the force model actually is doing um, better than the uh, un, than the uh, prediction, and the warmer colors are where the prediction was actually better than the uh, the force model. But but these errors are, are really quite small. I mean, the, the color bar I'm showing you on here um, is plus or minus five centimeters. Okay, so just in the, in the sense of getting to the point that this is the starting point of where we'd like to be, there, there's one thing, why didn't I get a better Atlantic solution out of this, even when I told it believed the observations? Well, there's a subtle point in an ensemble, when you do this ensemble common filter, the correction is basically a combination of the members that you had in the ensemble, and so if the ensemble never generates an improvement in a region, you can never make any, any correction to make it better. So that's what we think happened in, uh, um, in this particular, particular case, that the large-scale forcing perturbations that we applied just didn't make a big difference in the, in the Atlantic. I mean, they made some, but not as much as we would like. Okay. So, um, so we're proceeding with, with two approaches to try to look at this. One of which is to um, look at putting nested domains uh, in the areas where we have big errors to try to get locally a better solution. Um, and the other is to look at it and generate a new set of perturbations which have smaller scales to represent the character of the errors that we've got. Um, but that given, we can actually go ahead and use this model to look at um, what's happening in the, the ocean when I have the tides in concert with the, the global circulation. So when, when the tide, tide flows over topography in a stratified medium, it generates an internal wave. That wave happens, happens to actually be at tidal frequency, so we call it an internal tide. It's an internal gravity wave. Um, and so these are the internal tides that are generated in the, inside the three-dimensional model that we had. Where we, we're now. And one of the things you'll, you'll notice is that there's very strong generation in patches, and those tide, tidal energy propagate away in beams that actually travel for quite long distances. Okay. Um, and so it was exciting to see this in, um, in the ocean model. Of course, the satellite people had actually seen it beforehand. Um, and, and then the other is that why don't these beams go all the way to the other coast? What's happening to them? Why, why do they appear to dissipate when you uh, uh, propagate them? And it, it's an important question because it turns out it could be that all that's happening is that the beams are being scattered, but that means that um, they develop a random character to them. And so when I do a harmonic analysis, they appear to disappear. It's what's called, they become incoherent. Or they could actually be being dissipated. That is to say, the energy is being lost. Um, what's going on? And uh, just to sort of uh, follow up with what I said earlier, on the top is what the altimeter actually saw for the surface signature of internal uh, waves. Um, if you look at the color bar here, it's it's one centimeter, plus or minus. Um, it's one centimeter total. So remember I have that satellite. It's a 1,000 kilometers out in space. And I'm actually now looking at signals that are this big, uh, one centimeter in height. It's, it's uh, remarkable how far we've come with that. Thing. But if you look at this thing, the, the pictures here, we, we analyze the model heights exactly the way you recover this thing from the altimeter. The altimeter tracks are about three degrees apart. So there's all these white spots. That's just the altimeter never sees it. So it's not that there's no um, tide there or anything. It's just that we don't see it with the altimeter. Okay. Um, that's just the orbital mechanics. You can't make a satellite uh, um, behave completely independently like you'd like. Um, but if you begin to see that the satellite sees those same sort of hot spots that we saw in the model, and you can see that 
Uh, it's not as easy, but you can see that those beams don't go all the way to the coast. They, they appear to dissipate. Um, and uh, so when we actually look at that and we can, we can do things in the model that you can't do in the, with the altimeter, um, so one of the things we find is that as you look at the tide, so I can run this for a, the model for a long time, and then I can do harmonic analysis to pull out the tide on short bits, and I can say how much from month to month, how much does the semidurnal internal tide amplitude vary? And I can get a measure of that standard deviation. So if it varies a lot, that means it's not a particularly coherent signal. If it varies very little, it's a very coherent signal. So um, if you look on this picture, you see these bright spots of quite incoherent, large standard deviation with these blue spots in the middle. Of course, that's where the generation is. So very close to where the tide is generated, it's very coherent. And as I propagate away from that, it becomes less and less coherent, becomes incoherent. It hasn't necessarily dissipated. It's just that the technique that I'm using is not able to describe it in a, in a consistent fashion. Um, and there's an experiment that was done um, by uh, Ponte and Klein. Um, they did an idealized experiment. And so they have this little channel. And in the channel, they have a, basically an unstable jet that's going across. It's generating lots of eddies. And they put a wave maker in here that generates an internal tide and a propagates across. And so if you look at it, um, which I guess I'm supposed to point it sorry. Um, if, you, if you look at the signal, you can see that in the, um, near the wave maker, you've got these nice plain fronts that come across. They hit the eddies, and all of a sudden it becomes this very chaotic sort of thing. Um, if you look at the, the far right panel, that's a measure of the, the energy. So it's, it's kind of the amplitudes of these things. And so you can see near the wave maker, everything is fairly coherent. Okay, so, and I hit that um, cross channel and I go from being a very coherent signal, the dark black, to being a very incoherent signal, which is the lighter color. But in this particular case, if you notice, there's a slight decrease in the amplitude, but it's mostly that I scattered it rather than I dissipated it. So this is kind of an um, interesting uh, result, which has... Um, consequences for where is the tidal energy being lost into the system. Um, so these are some new things that we've discovered with the tides. It also leads to the fact that there might be some hope that we may be able to predict some of the internal tidal uh, energy. Usually you talk to people and they say that along the coasts everything's incoherent. But if in fact I have strong beams that are generated and I actually knew all the, the uh, um, refractors between where I, where I generated and where I am, I might actually be able to make some statement about what actually is that, what we would think of incoherent part of the beam. Um, so we're, we're trying to look at ways to see whether or not you can actually verify that in the model and how you might actually um, look at that in, um, in reality. Um, and that would help us a lot because now we'd say, remember I said that initially we thought the internal tides from coming from far away might change the, the regional solution. They might affect what you're doing. Well, but if they're incoherent, if I have no knowledge with them, I don't know how to put them into a boundary condition in some way. But if I can tell you something about what is apparently incoherent, that is, it's not simply related back to the original source, but I was able to trace it, trace it along through all the scatterers, I might be able to make a, a better prediction of what's going on. Um, and then lastly, I'm going to fill in, remember, an internal tide is just an internal wave at tidal frequency. Well, in, in the mid-70s, Chris Garrett and Walter Monk came up with a, a prediction of the statistical um, shape of the um, frequency spectrum for internal waves. Okay. It's called the Garrett and Monk spectrum. Um, and so they found that within a few slight tunable parameters about this, what the stratification is, and a little bit about how the, the structure of the thermocline functions. You can make a prediction for what the amplitude 
um, and shape in frequency for the internal gravity wave field. In this case. So the black line is this Garrett and Monk spectrum. The red line actually is a, a mooring, an observations from a mooring. So this is the uh, just a current meter that's out there for a long time, and we just uh, did the spectrum of that. And the green and blue lines are two of our simulations from uh, the global model with the tons. And so the blue actually um, is the 8-kilometer model. It's, that's the current um, forecast system that we have. And the uh, green model is the 4-kilometer one, the much higher resolution model. And I think you can see that, that in fact, with this increasing resolution, um, you're seeing uh, more and more internal wave energy appearing. And we're being, getting get the model to approach the uh, the observations in its character. And uh, I didn't pull it off, but there's actually now a 148th degree global model that's been run by um, people using a different model uh, at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And if you make this plot, it, it does even better. So as the resolution of the model is increasing, we apparently are, in fact, generating um, internal gravity waves now that we've added the tide. Um, and uh, so the, the question is, you know, am I, how am I really actually doing this and are these really internal waves in the proper way? So one of the things about an internal gravity wave is it has what's called a dispersion relationship. That is to say the horizontal wavelength of the waves and the vertical wave number or the and vertical wavelength and the frequency are all related by something that's called a dispersion relationship. So if I, if I have a frequency and I have the horizontal wave number, then I also know what the vertical wave number is. Now we can do this in terms of what's called vertical modes. It's just a, um, a different way of describing it. So on this particular plot, the color is the frequency wave number spectrum from the model um, for the internal internal gravity waves. And the white lines represent the range of the dispersion curves over this box. The box was really rather big. It's about 10 degrees. And over 10 degrees, the Coriolis frequency and the stratification change a little bit. So there's some blurring of the dispersion relation. It's not a simple, simple line because you've changed the environment. And you can see that um, what I've got is the energy that I was filling in in the model that you saw in the frequency spectrum is actually also filling in on the model along the dispersion curves. So the brighter colors fall on those lines. And I've, I've highlighted what's modes 1 to 4. Actually, by the time you get to 5, 6, and 7 in the model, one, we don't generate those very well with the, with the resolution we have in the vertical. And the other is they begin to collapse enough that, that they sort of all sort of lie in on top of each other. So this other big band that you see is really kind of where all the high modes are sort of collapsing on each other. So, so this is confirming that, in fact, that energy I see is actually looking like internal gravity waves. So I really am generating internal gravity waves inside the, the global model. Um, and, um, and then if you look more carefully, this is a calculation that um, Brian's brought to the table, we can actually do and look at, so where are the nonlinear transfers? That is to say, where am I taking energy from one wavelength and putting it into another wavelength? Okay, so this is a picture of the places I'm extracting energy from and where I'm putting energy into it. Um, so you'll see that circle, um, those little bands of blue, those are the internal tides, very narrow speak so it's the two primary um, uh, sets of ties. And then you see down here, I also have a band that's associated with the near inertial. That's the wind-driven um, internalized. And I'm taking energy from those, um, those waves. So I added internal tides because I put the tide in. I gave it a source of energy that I'm now extracting from. And the color doesn't match really great, but you can see that that I have red predominantly that's appearing 
um, into the places where I, I'm filling in that spectrum of internal gravity waves. And this particular approach um, would argue that it's, it's what's called a triad interaction. Um, and uh, so that basically means I have an internal tide wave, another wave, and those two things interact to generate a third wave, and that's how I move the energy around. Um, and it also helps explain if, if I went back a few pictures to that frequency spectrum that I showed, you remember the, the blue line seems to have these big bumps, um, and that's because I'm beginning to get a very discrete sets of waves that I can do, so the triad interaction can't fill things out smoothly because I don't have the resolution to actually fill in um, the wave spectrum. Um, so, um, so now we actually have, in, in a global model, we have a prediction of the barotropic tide, a prediction, if you want, of the ocean circulation simultaneously. That barotropic tide is generating internal tides and the interactions with the internal tides and um, other motions are in fact generating internal gravity waves. And so I have an increasingly realistic picture of what the global ocean looks like. Um, and we know, for example, that we think if we increase the resolution of the model, we should do a better job in, in filling in the internal gravity wave spectrum. Um, it's just that's a very expensive calculation to do. And uh, so I've summarized a lot of other people's work um, and probably not given an adequate uh, justification, but I think you can get a sense for what we, or at least I feel, is a really exciting um, you know, modeling uh, enhancement and advance that we've made. Um, and we're kind of proud that the people have picked up on that and realized that it can be done. And so there are other groups around the world that are trying to add this into their uh, global ocean models. So at that point, I'll take any questions that people might have. Yes? One is uh, the drug coefficient and the C for the different times. Uh, what, what, what the metric is? <laughs> okay, so, so the question that was asked in the room was, Basically, what are the size of the drag coefficient um, and the uh, for the quadratic bo bottom drag and the drag coefficient for the uh, um, internal wave drag? Um, so the, the bottom drag is, uh, you know, 0 0.0025, which is kind of a typical number um, for CD. Uh, yeah. Okay. And the... Um, the C, the actual value of the C is, is kind of not independent with the choice of, your, of the, um, the roughness field. So um, we use something that's called a Jane and Saint Laurent. So it's a variable uh, drag um, field. Um, and we also had to do something which is that we have to clip it because the, the actual roughness can be too large, which makes the numerics unstable in places. Um, and uh, bear with me. Do you guys remember what the full drag numbers are? I'm so used. Right. Okay. So. Um, so. So it's it's about two times ten to the minus five. Days to the minus, uh, seconds to the minus one. And the uh, second question is uh, the Atlantic Ocean has largest ever. Yes. And compared to the Pacific, right. the Pacific has no, like, uh, no boundary. So, like atoms. And Atlantic is the ocean feature of a two boundary, you know, very narrow. And uh, I wonder the common filter. What dynamic 
uh, my guess is uh, that the whole new wow is uh, like a reverse integration of the dynamic model is needed to reduce the substantial increase in I'll, I'll, I'll try to, for the uh, remote audience, I'll try to, to uh, summarize the question a little bit. So the, the question actually comes about from the data assimilation, which is to say that the, um, the solution was better in the Pacific than in the Atlantic. The Pacific is kind of a, is a very large ocean. Uh, the Atlantic is much smaller. So geometry and, um, may actually matter. And the common filter doesn't know anything about dynamics. It's just a, a blender. And so it may, in fact, not be the best way of, of trying to blend with the data. The suggestion is potentially something like a 4D VAR, which would um, give you a measure of the dynamics into your data simulation. It's probably the case. The difficulty is uh, trying to sort out um, how I do 4D VAR on something which has really quite different physics. The, the physics of the um, the tides, particularly the internal tides, for example, are very different than the physics for mesoscale eddies. Yet, a mode one internal tide has the same general scale as a, as a mesoscale eddy. So we haven't quite figured out how, how to do that. But maybe a different answer to your question is the tides have resonances. Okay, So there are certain areas, the Bay of Funday, Hudson Strait, the Bay of Biscay, um, actually Sivakosk, some of these, where you have very, very large tides because you actually get, a, get resonances um, in what's going on. And work that Brian has done with, with Chris Garrett actually show that those resonances that are local actually affect the global tidal solution. So that's why we've been thinking that if we could get perturbations or we could nest the models to get the models to be capable of, of resolving those resonances that we could improve the tidal solution. So that's the approach that we're, we're taking um, rather than trying to pursue a 4D VAR uh, data simulation. Um, Nagodok et al. in ocean modeling 2016. But um, if they want to email me, um, so you can get me at james.richmond.ctr at nrlssc.navy.mil. Or if that's too long, you can send it to my farm. It's jr at cornercreekfarm, all one word, dot com. Um, and I'll get back to you with a, with a full reference and a PDF of the paper. Um, and then there's a question you had, yes? Yeah, I guess uh, I'm trying to understand exactly what the themes are. They originate from a topographic feature and go yes. in the direction of the so, so, so what actually happens is, if you, if you sort of think about it, you're, you're propagating over and you're hitting a, a, a sort of a, a, a facet, if you want, a bit of topography. And so you generate a wave. And so it's like that's like that's where the wave maker is. Okay. So so in in the reality, I've got all these wave makers, and so they themselves kind of create these planar planar waves that, that come out from the uh, the facets. Um, and uh, so if you if you look at it, sort of you can identify kind of the major generating topographic features. They each have a beam associated with them. So if we walk back. I'm kind of wondering to what extent they diffract sideways. Well, OK. So, so the fact of the matter is they're, they're not, it's, it's not like a point source, which would give you a radiating, a radial beam. They're really, really from a sort of a flat facet. So it tends to give you kind of a plane wave type generation of limited scope. And so yes, that beam will disperse over time. So part of the loss that you see here could in fact be the beams dispersing. Although when you look at this picture, it's not like that's the dominant color feature that you see, you know, which is the beam just kind of disappearing because it's, it's going up. 
but I mean, it's, they seem to be, you know, keeping their structure relatively coherently for, for a fairly long distance. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. And I forgot to repeat the question. That the the question actually was, you know, why do I see the generating the internal tides being generated in these very narrow beams? Um, what's the actual mechanism for for uh, for generating them and why are they in these tight beams? And at least my my sort of intuition is that it's that it actually just has to do with the character of the way that you generate the waves um, by interaction with with a critical slope, effectively. Um, and if I'm really off base, chime in, anybody. Any other questions? All right, thanks for bearing with me, and uh, I hope at least it was interesting. <laughs>